Well, of course, the hope, the hope is and experience shows that material like this does contribute to um, reduced uh, civilian casualties uh, and a higher threshold for war um, and more cautious planning for war and hopefully in this case an understanding and, and careful planning of what the exit policy is for Afghanistan. I mean, this is a war that has been going on now uh, for nine years uh, and has clearly been getting worse for the past three years. Um, it, something has got to change in this equation and uh, soldiers, foot soldiers, are of course um, victims of war. Uh, they do benefit to some degree. I mean, they benefit in terms of their career and uh, in terms of money. They, these are not people that are uh, frequently not people that are totally innocent unless they are conscripts. Uh, but they can be very substantial victims. I mean, in, the, in this case in Afghanistan, um, individual soldiers who have lost their lives have lost all their life. Uh, however, it is true that um, the kill ratios uh, for this war are disturbing. So the event that I just showed you before of 181 people being killed, um, there was one US soldier who died versus 181 um, people who were claimed, claimed to be Taliban. Um, when you have kill ratios like that, um, uh, war becomes indiscriminate. And when the, when the vehicles for killing are uh, aerial, so AC-130 gunships or Apaches, um, you really have a video game because you press the button and you see an explosion uh, and there's very little effect on you. Um, you're, every day people walk down the street uh, and step on ants uh, and you no know, one pays too much attention because uh, ants can't defend themselves. Uh, so we, I think, sh should actually never be in a position where militaries are so unequal uh, in their relationship uh, because that leads inevitably to abuse. Anne, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anne Linde. I'm from the Social Democratic Party and I have two questions. One is the, the most um, attention has been given to those leaks uh, that has been um, about war, the Iraq and Afghanistan. Are you intentionally uh, trying to get your most attention to this or are you also trying to get attention, for example, on uh, exploitation, on child work or, or um, forced labor and things like that? Or is it peace and war that is WikiLeaks' main area of concentration? And the second question is, do you care how the material you get is gotten in a way? And the question is um, because in Sweden, to simplify it, if you are in an authority and say something to journalists, the authorities cannot see from where the leak is. That's forbidden. But if someone is trying to break in to get the same material, then it's forbidden. And um, they could be um, taken to court or so. Do you care if somebody breaks in to get the material or do you only take material that someone on the inside is, is given to you? Yeah. For focus, we are very clear uh, to pers prospective whistleblowers and journalists or other people who have been censored what we do and do not do. And I think that is one of our strengths as a media organization is that we do not see ourselves as merely representing an opinion uh, and then looking for news that backs up that opinion. Rather, we see our role as representatives of people who have information to provide the public. We see our role like lawyers. Lawyers represent their clients to a court and to a jury. We represent sources, whistleblowers and people who freedom of speech is under threat to the jury of public opinion. And so we try and get as much impact uh, for their material as is possible. And we state that 
we will accept material that is of diplomatic, political, ethical or historical significance that has not been published previously, that is not self-authored, so it's official documents, um, that is under some kind of restriction. Provided that is met, we publish uh, after harm minimization review. So we, we guarantee to publish. And that has kept us impartial uh, in the same way, not perfectly, but in the same way that courts are kept impartial by saying that provided you meet certain initial criteria, the court will hear your case. Provided um, our sources meet a certain initial criteria because we can't do everything, we're not big enough, uh, we will try and get public opinion uh, to hear the case. Um, now, the sort of misapprehension that we concentrate on the US military um, is simply because that's what people in English like to talk about. They don't like to talk about the work we've been doing in Kenya. They don't like to talk about the work that we do in East Timor. They don't like to talk about the work we do in Spanish or in South America. Uh, they like to talk about um, the US military. And there is no doubt, uh, as the largest military power in the world, uh, whose, whose military spending uh, is greater than that of all other countries combined, um, that, uh, and has a, an extensive secrecy system, that the US military is an important player uh, of, of those groups that are trying to conceal information that would lead to political reform if it was revealed. Um, on Fox recently, um, a, uh, a Fox host, um, or rather a Fox panelist, uh, said, well, WikiLeaks wouldn't be too bad, you know, if they actually ever did non-military reporting. Why don't they talk about tobacco, as an example? If they only spoke about tobacco, they might be a legitimate organization. But because they speak about the US military only, they're not a legitimate organization. So I had a look. You go, go to our search box and type in tobacco. You will see hundreds of reports about tobacco companies uh, and how tobacco is managed around the world. Uh, those are, are simply not things that um, are so dramatically newsworthy that people want to talk about them so much. Um, and your, your second question was... If you care about how you get the information... Oh, yeah. Quite interesting. Now, one of the Pentagon demands was that we stop... And the exact phraseology was that we stop soliciting material from government sources in the United States. Um, now, we had a look to see on our submission page, was there solicitation in that sense? Uh, there wasn't uh, in any concrete sense. So it, in the United States jurisprudence, the solicitation is you sort of have asking someone for a particular document, as an example. And we don't do that. We say we will provide an avenue. We did last year send out an email to some 5,000 members of the US military um, saying that we could help them with the False Claims Act, an act, a federal act in the US that helps discover fraud against the government. Uh, and there's a lot of fraud by military contractors. Uh, so we work with a lawyer to try and expose that fraud. And it's really very progressive legislation. Um, the, the whistleblower who reveals the fraud uh, is entitled to between 15 and 90 percent of the uh, fraud discovered. Um, so we uh, sent out that email. But otherwise, I can't think of anything else that uh, would uh, classify as solicitation. Not that we would be against that. Um, I think it would, in fact, be right to, to ask uh, uh, people within military or in government institutions for particular documents. I mean, I don't see any particular problem with that. Um, for, in terms of knowing where things come from and how they obtained, uh, we're specialists in not knowing. Um, it's very difficult to deal with major state intelligence agencies. Um, and over time, it is in fact, it would be impossible for us to keep secret uh, information over, say, a course of 10 years from the Chinese Public Security Bureau, from uh, the SVR in Russia, and from the National Security Agency. It would just not be possible. So we don't try to do that. What we try to do is never collect information about sources in the first place. 
So because we don't know who they are, uh, we don't know how they get the material, um, and we don't ask them to go and, and break in. So in, in terms of US jurisprudence, um, uh, there's not an issue for us. Uh, in terms of Swedish jurisprudence, uh, that would also be the case because that has a higher standard. Mm. David, please. Uh, David, David Isaacson, editor at uh, Global Reporting. Uh, I can see some parallel what you're doing to, to the reporting by Seymour Hersh in the 70s from, from the Vietnam War, actually the, on the My Lai Massacre. Uh, his reporting was not done in the field. He did interviews with people. I mean, the technology was different. Uh, and all that, and you showed us the embedded reporter who was most concerned with his taking a shower than what he actually was the reality in the country. Uh, my question to, to you is, do you see from your reporting and the effect it has had and the, the, how it's been so well spread in the world, that other media might reconsider how they report from war, that they will put more focus on, on uh, investigative reporting and less on, on sending reporters out as embedded reporters. Second question, uh, uh, your, the, the news you have spread, I mean spread all over the world and media is picking up. Do you see any increase in your income? You, are, you need income to continue with the investigative reporting. Do people also take part in financing your work? Yeah. So I'll answer the last question first because it's a very important one. Um, since the funding for our organization uh, has come from the people involved directly uh, up until January this year. Um, it came from me and, and others uh, who were directly involved, uh, totally committed into spending both their time and money. Um, but as, as we grew and as the demands grew, um, for example, the bandwidth for the, the um, collateral murder video was uh, uh, worth six hundred thousand um, dollars. Fortunately, we were able to gain subsidies uh, for that uh, from Google. Um, but it can be expensive to run such a large, um, uh, such a popular uh, operation. Um, but since January, we have called upon the general public to assist us, uh, and we have raised some million uh, dollars, which is not a lot um, uh, when considering the demands that we have. But it is completely independent. It is not from a foundation. It is from people like the people in this room. Um, it is from mums and dads uh, from all over the world. Uh, and that is giving us, um, a, I think, an unparalleled degree of independence uh, in what we can publish. We have tried to um, uh, get foundation funding uh, during that period. Uh, and in fact, we were rated first out of 3,000 applications to the Knight Foundation, which hands out about 100 uh, and something million dollars per year in the United States. Uh, then we released um, uh, the uh, video showing the slaying of two Reuters journalists and 18 other people in Baghdad, uh, and that application was cancelled for what judges, uh, to what two judges involved tell us is for political reasons. Um, so it, it really is important to have a diverse uh, funding base that is um, built around uh, the interests of people uh, and not um, organisations that are busy um, uh, in power plays. And I'm sorry, and your, your first question was? Uh, if, you, if you see your, uh, your example, you're setting an example that oh, yes. more media. Yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, if you're setting an example that more yeah. media resources into investigative reporting from yep. war zones. So you mentioned the example of Cy Hirsch uh, and the My Lai Massacre. So I spoke to Cy Hirsch about this last year. And while many people un have heard of the My Lai Massacre as the sort of archetypical example of abuse exposed in Vietnam, what people probably don't know is that Cy Hirsch couldn't get that story out, that he wrote, uh, submitted it to New York Times, Washington Post, etc., and it was not accepted. 